Grant me five minutes in a locked room with this demon. No, sir, I can't. Would you do give me that. one minute? You know that I can't do that. That's not how our legal system works. Well, I'm going to have to. Oh. Oh. Dale Williams. Dale Williams. This is Dale Williams. The 62-year-old Ohio man is appearing at Youngston Court for sentencing after pleading guilty to the murder of his ex-partner, 46-year-old Elizabeth Pledger Stewart. Williams details the grisly events of the premeditated murder, telling the judge how he picked the perfect time of day to run Elizabeth off the road with his car before opening fire on her as she stood on the sidewalk, shooting her repeatedly. The atmosphere is palpable as Williams gives his account, and it's about to get a whole lot crazier in the courtroom. In case you missed it, we'll slow it down for you. Watch the courtroom officer pushing Williams to safety as Elizabeth's son, Anthony, seen in the black sweatshirt, lunges across the table towards the man who murdered his mother. Despite two officers trying to restrain him, he manages to land a punch on Williams and drag him to the ground. Anthony then falls backward and the two men wrestle as the female officer grabs her taser. With the brawl kicking off in the blink of an eye, it's easy to miss Anthony's brother, Jerome, who can be seen here in red. He swoops in to help, but is quickly pinned to the wall by an officer. However, he wriggles free and throws himself into the melee on the floor. While this is going on, Elizabeth's daughter hops up and down in a distressed state, screaming at her brothers to stop. After some fumbling, the female officer manages to remove her taser from its holster and deploys it on Anthony, forcing him into submission. Meanwhile, Jerome continues to beat Williams before finally being pulled away by a male officer. Williams is rushed out of the courtroom by officers before the situation escalates any further, and Jerome is placed in handcuffs. As he lays there, he offers some justification for the attack. Williams is eventually sentenced to 23 years to life for the murder of Elizabeth Pledger Stewart, while her sons, Anthony and Jerome, are charged with assault, contempt of court, and obstructing official business. The attack on Williams by family members of his victim may seem like fair retribution to some people, but unfortunately, it isn't always the bad guy that ends up on the receiving end of violence in the courtroom, like in the case of Joshua Harding. It's a tense moment for 35-year-old Harding, who's appearing at the Veterans Memorial Courthouse in Michigan on sexual assault charges. He shuffles nervously from foot to foot as the jury file back into the courtroom to deliver their verdict. The case is being prosecuted by Ingham County Prosecutor Jonathan Roth, who stands beside his female co-counsel at the other desk. Harding has a history of similar offenses, and if he's found guilty, it's looking likely that he'll go down for a long time. However, he doesn't want to wait around to hear his fate and you won't believe what happens next. Watch carefully as Harding's right hand slips up his left sleeve, where he has concealed a makeshift prison shank. In the blink of an eye, he lunges across the room toward Roth, bearing down on him with the rough blade. Roth is saved only by the lightning-fast reflexes of the Meridian Township detective on his right, who spots Harding on the move and jumps in front of the prosecutor, tackling his attacker with impressive agility. Harding is brought to the ground by the detective, and with some help from a number of other officers, he's eventually disarmed. Roth can be seen here looking understandably flustered, but thanks to the quick actions of the detective, the prosecutor was ultimately unhurt. Harding later tells police that he fully intended on killing Roth with the shank. He is sentenced to 19 years for the sexual assault charges and gets a further 30 to 60 year consecutive sentence for assault with the intent to murder Jonathan Roth meaning he will serve almost five decades in prison before he will be eligible for release. Unprovoked attacks like Harding's are thankfully rare, but serve as a stark reminder to deputies in the courtroom to be on guard at all times. However, sometimes even the judge can end up being victimized by the very person that they are trying to protect the public from, like in the case of Melissa Hardwick. Hardwick is in family court in Kentucky before Judge Jennifer Edwards, after her estranged partner filed a domestic violence complaint against her. 
The ex-partner begins to give his testimony to the judge, but after just a few sentences, Hardwick becomes belligerent and starts interrupting in a volatile manner. Personal life is no, no. your business, John. It has nothing to do with Miss Hardwick. Boys. Judge Edwards issues a clear warning to the increasingly irate Hardwick. No. You will be held in contempt of this court if you I become disruptive. But it falls on deaf ears. And Hardwick continues her tirade. I don't care. I haven't done anything to this court. I haven't done anything to okay. him. Tired of the woman's lack of respect in her courtroom, the judge decides to put an end to the matter with a contempt charge. And you won't believe how Hardwick reacts. She will be arrested for contempt any, of the court. Make any you will serve uh, 10 days for contempt of court. You go now. Judge Edwards hands down a 10-day sentence for contempt of court, but as she directs the deputies to remove Hardwick from the courtroom, the woman erupts in a fit of violence. Watch as she throws herself at the bench, lunging across the desk in an attempt to grab Judge Edwards, before being taken down by two court deputies. Despite the near miss, the judge seems unfazed, even as Hardwick continues to scream and resist arrest. As she is eventually hauled from the courtroom by the officers, Hardwick issues a verbal threat to Judge Edwards. However, the judge is having none of it, and she lets the clerk know that she will be filing criminal charges against Hardwick for her threats and behavior in court. I knew Judge will have to be appointed to represent because she will be charged criminally for the threats that were made in open court today. Ultimately, Judge Edwards orders that the domestic violence charges filed by Hardwick's husband would stand, and in separate criminal proceedings, Hardwick is sentenced to 120 days in jail for contempt of court. She also pleads guilty to intimidating a participant in the legal process. But she avoids any further jail time by agreeing to a court-ordered diversion program for five years. When faced with Melissa Hardwick's errant behavior, Judge Edwards keeps her cool remarkably well. But sometimes, court romantics get so crazy that they resemble a soap opera, and nobody knows this better than Judge William Bo Leach. Judge Leach is presiding over a hearing at the Owsley County Courthouse in Boonville, Kentucky. Before him is Shane Bird, who's accused of driving under the influence during an incident which resulted in a young woman being injured. The hearing has been uneventful so far, with the defendant agreeing to pay a $500 restitution fine to the woman who was injured as a result of his actions. Judge Leach is satisfied with the outcome and is ready to move on to the next case of the day, but unbeknownst to him, there's a situation simmering in the public gallery that's just about to reach boiling point. What happens next is something the judge has never seen before. The blonde lady in the back row here is the defendant's wife, Ingrid Bird, while the dark-haired lady in the row in front of her is Peggy Gabbard, the mother of the woman who Shane Bird has just been ordered to pay restitution to. It seems the pair aren't on the best of terms. Judge Leach moves the call to the next case on his list, but suddenly, all hell breaks loose in the gallery. In case you missed it, here it is again. Watch as Ingrid Bird holds Peggy Gabbard on an outstretched arm as the pair scuffle. Gabbard then catches Bird with her left hand while landing a solid right fist down on Bird's face, knocking the blonde woman backwards. A number of deputies can be seen running up the aisle towards the commotion, while the remaining gallery members look on in a mixture of shock and bemusement. The woman in the striped shirt bypasses the sheriff's deputies, and as they move to restrain Ingrid Bird, this woman jumps to her defense and shouts at Gabbard. The tension continues to rise, and incredibly, even Shane Bird himself gets involved, walking up the aisle of the gallery to see what's going on. The women continue to hurl insults at each other as Ingrid Bird is dragged away by officers, and as she exits the courtroom, peace is finally restored. But the situation isn't over yet. Judge Leach is furious at the unruly conduct, and he knows he needs to exercise his authority with full rigor to re-establish order in his courtroom. He pinpoints the woman with the striped shirt, directing her to the jury box, while he looks toward the court deputies to identify and apprehend anyone else who was involved in the melee. There, lady with the red purse, you need to go to the jury box. Who else was involved in that fight? Hey, Judge Leach singles out the defendant and berates him, also sending him to the jury box. All right, Shane Bird. Out of the jury box, and I told you not to when you were running over there saying that was your wife. 
In a show of command, he sentences everyone involved to 30 days in jail for contempt and has some stern words for them before they are led away. Everybody that was in that is getting 30 days in jail and contempt. Ultimately, four people are charged with contempt arising from the brawl. Ingrid Bird also receives an additional charge of assault. Before continuing with the day's caseload, Judge Leash issues a stern warning to everyone else in the courtroom before finally normal service resumes. If it breaks out anything today, you're going to get six months in jail on contempt. If you all want to try me, you wait and see if you don't get six months in jail. With so much tension and nervous energy in the air, it's unsurprising that courtrooms can sometimes erupt like this for seemingly insignificant reasons. And as we see in the next case, it's often the most unsuspecting people that you have to watch. Randall Margraves is in court to see the sentencing of disgraced gymnastics doctor Larry Nassar. Nassar is at the end of a lengthy trial where he was found guilty of grooming and sexually assaulting hundreds of young elite gymnasts over the span of two decades when he worked as a sports medicine osteopathic physician. It's day nine of the sentencing hearing before Eaton County Circuit Judge Janice Cunningham and more than 150 athletes have turned up to give their harrowing impact statements. It has impacted women, children and families of varying ages, races and walks of life. So tensions are already running high in the courtroom. Margraves' three daughters are victims of Nassar and two of them have just given their victim impact statements to the court. So he's understandably upset when he interrupts the proceedings, asking the judge if he can have the chance to speak. Judge, what a distraught father have a chance to say something. Go ahead. Sir. Given his calm and collected demeanor, the judge gives him permission to address the court. He begins by swearing at Nassar, and Judge Cunningham quickly reprimands him for doing so, though she is considerate of his anger. We don't want to swear. We don't want to have profanity. I can't imagine the anger. Because the father of three maintains his composure, the judge allows him to continue, but she warns him against using profanity again. And if you need to say something to help you, I'm more than willing to let you say something. But in a courtroom, we, we, try, we don't use profanity. But if With remarkable daring, Margrave makes a stunning appeal to Judge Cunningham. He wants to be given five minutes alone in a room with Nassar, whom he calls a demon. I would ask you to, as part of this sentencing, to grant me five minutes in the locker room of this demon. Listen to the muffled laughter in the courtroom as the judge politely declines his request. However, Margraves is undeterred, and he repeats his request, this time asking for just one minute. Would you give me one minute? He still appears totally calm and collected, but something has shifted slightly, and one of his daughters seems to pick up on this, as she whispers a plea for her father to stop. You know that I can't do that, that's... What happens next is beyond belief. Out of the blue, Margraves sprints towards Nassar, throwing himself at the table between the two men. In a split-second reaction, Nassar's defense attorney and a quick-thinking sheriff's deputy leap in front of Nassar, deflecting Margraves' attempt to get to the convict. A second officer grabs Margraves from behind, pulling him to the ground as Nassar is swept from his chair and out of the courtroom to safety. Deputies pile onto Margraves on the ground as he finally shows his loss of composure. Struggling beneath them and shouting again that he just wants one minute with Nassar. They cuff him and with Margraves back to his former calm self, he asks the deputies a thought-provoking question. What if this happened to you guys? The reaction of the bespectacled deputy here suggests that his own reaction wouldn't be too far from that of Margraves. Margraves is walked from the court flanked by guards, one of whom can be seen patting him supportively on the shoulder. District Attorney Angela Pavelitis can be heard addressing the court in the background, and Margraves shoots her a sharp comment as he is let out. The event causes consternation in the court, and with many victims still waiting to give their impact statement, Pavelitis issues them with a very strong warning. After a brief recess, Margraves is brought back in front of Judge Cunningham, looking more relaxed now. Judge Cunningham lays out the potential penalties of Margraves' behavior. That I could give you a jail sentence. I could fine you up to $7,500. I could order any costs or expenses associated with the proceeding. 
but then goes on to sympathize with him as a fellow parent. I can see that absolutely creating an anger and a rage so great that any parent would want to do physical harm. So I understand that. Margraves addresses the judge, explaining his actions and apologizing profusely to the court and the officers who had to deal with his outburst. I'd like to apologize to everyone in the courtroom and all the officers. I came here in support of my daughters. I've dealt with my daughters as late very delicately. I'm realizing they may never trust a man again. And I look over here and Larry Nasser's shaking his head no like it didn't happen. Who would put herself through this? Judge Cunningham accepts his apology and no further charges are brought against Margraves, who ultimately becomes something of a hero for his actions. Larry Nassar eventually receives a sentence of 175 years in federal prison for his heinous crimes. You will serve 40 to 125 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. Unfortunately, not all courtroom attacks are in the name of well-deserved revenge, and some, like the case of Michael Cox Jr., challenge the whole justice system. Cox has just been found guilty of criminal sexual contact of a minor under the age of 13 by an Otero County jury. The trial is about to conclude, and the jury members are still sitting when Cox's defense attorney and deputy district attorney, Scott Key, approach the judge for a bench conference to verify the guilty verdict. Cox keeps his head down, but his rising frustration is evident from the twitching of his seat. Both attorneys turn to go back to their seats with Key, who can be seen here in the dark suit, leading the way. What happens next is a shocking reminder of the dangers that prosecutors face in the course of their work. The incident happens so quickly that it takes a few seconds for his own stunned defense attorney to realize what's happening. With Key on the ground, Cox pounces on him, beating him as court deputies rush to pull him off. Watch as members of the public gallery flock to see what's happening, prompting Judge Jerry Ritter to run from his bench and direct the deputy to clear the gallery. Here's a closer look. Judge Ritter is ushering the public out of the gallery as a flailing Scott Key is lifted from the floor. Once back on his feet, Key makes a move toward Cox, but he's pulled back to the center of the courtroom where he removes his jacket. Meanwhile, two sheriff's deputies can be seen restraining Cox on the ground as he continues to struggle against them. They eventually manage to cuff him and they lift him to his feet and over to a chair at the side of the room as Judge Ritter returns to the bench. Meanwhile, Key regains his composure and tidies the mess around his desk. In the end, Cox receives an 18-year sentence for the charge of sexual conduct with a minor, and his loss of control in the courtroom sees him hit with a further six and a half years in prison. Cox's actions in the courtroom came totally out of the blue, but sometimes a defendant's actions throughout the trial are so abominable that it's no surprise when they take any opportunity they can to attack. One such case is Joseph Zeeler. Zeeler is on trial in Florida for what has become known as the 1990 Babysitter Cold Case, in which 11-year-old Robin Cornell and 32-year-old Lisa Story were assaulted and murdered by an intruder who snuck into the Cape Corral condominium where the pair were sleeping. DNA was collected from the scene at the time, but there were no live matches in the system. However, in 2009, Florida introduced a law which stated that anyone arrested for a felony had to have DNA taken, and in 2016, that law was enforced on Joseph Zeeler after he was arrested for aggravated battery on his own son. When uploaded to the national database, Zeeler's DNA was found to match the sample taken from the 1990 crime scene, and he was subsequently arrested and charged with the murders. Zeeler's conduct has been particularly callous throughout the trial. While giving testimony in his own defense, Zeeler called Robin Cornell's mother, Jan, a pig. I slept with Jan Cornell and Leanne Deller, and they were just too much of a pig not to wash their sheets. It also emerged that following his arrest, he sent Jan three letters threatening retribution on her if the case went ahead. And that letter was addressed to who, sir? J.G. Batista and family. So I was trying to send it to everybody. The whole Batista family? Yes. He sat remorseless through the proceedings, repeatedly locking eyes with Jan from the defense table in an attempt to intimidate her. Thankfully, Zeeler is found guilty on all counts. We, the jury, unanimously find that the first-degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Yes. Today is his sentencing hearing, where the 61-year-old will find out if he has been sentenced to death or not. Shockingly, Zeeler, whose rotting teeth had been prominent throughout his trial, is wearing a veneer in his mouth that has the word killer etched across it in marker. 
With all of this in mind, trial spectators have become accustomed to his disgusting antics, but what happens next still rocks the courtroom to the core. Shirley approaches him, leaning over so that his client can whisper into his ear, but instead, Zeeler draws back his right shoulder and swiftly delivers a blow to Shirley's forehead with his elbow. In case you missed it, here it is again. Watch as the two court deputies pounce on Zeeler, pinning him to the floor as he protests their force. Thankfully, his attorney is unharmed and remarkably unfazed by the attack as he calmly takes his seat, telling the judge that he has taken better shots than that in the past. I used to box, I've taken a lot better shots than that. Judge Robert Banning later denies Zeeler's motions for a retrial, instead sentencing him to death. The court concludes that under the laws of the state of Florida, the defendant has forfeited his right to live. Following the ruling, Zeeler addresses the court to protest his innocence, saying that he had nothing to do with the murders, but his pleas fall on deaf ears. His attorney, Kevin Shirley, later recounts the incident to waiting reporters, praising the speed and actions of the bailiffs. He acted like he didn't want our conversation to get picked up by the microphone, so he waved me down, so I bent over, and he struck me. So, and the bailiffs were extremely quick to respond and they eliminated any future threat. It's not often that we see killers as callous and brutal as Zeeler getting the chance to launch a courtroom attack, and more often than not, despite their violent crimes, it's the criminal who's on the receiving end of the physical violence, like in the case of Michael Madison. Serial killer Madison is in court today before Judge Nancy McDonald for sentencing, after he was found guilty of murdering three young women in East Cleveland. The bodies of his victims, Sherelda Terry, Angela Deskins and Shatisha Scheel were found concealed in a garage shared by Madison at his apartment building. The gruesome discovery was made after a television cable worker noticed a rancid smell in the area and called police to investigate. All of Madison's victims had been strangled to death. Madison has shown no remorse throughout his trial, and his behavior is in question as soon as he enters the court today, giving the finger to the courtroom camera. As the hearing progresses, he is seen grinning and smirking at times. Judge McDonald ultimately sentences him to death by lethal injection. Accordingly, the sentence of death is imposed upon the defendant, Michael Madison, on counts one, four, and seven. Madison sits impassively as the families of his victims read their impact statements, seemingly unaffected by the despair he has caused and the fact that he is now facing death for his crimes. Right now, I guess we're supposed to, in our hearts, forgive this crime. However, as Van Terry, father of 18-year-old Sherelda, turns to look at Madison during his impact statement, he becomes absolutely incensed to see the killer smirking back at him, and you won't believe what happens next. Terry bolts towards Madison, diving across the table to grab him. Incredibly, this makes Madison grin ever harder, and as court deputies rush to subdue Terry, Madison's face says it all. He's clearly enjoying the drama of the moment as his seat is pushed quickly out of the way of Terry's grappling arms. In case you missed it, here's the unbelievable moment again. Terry is flanked by officers and family members as they all try to restrain him. Meanwhile, Madison is led from the courtroom by a female deputy, still smirking, as he glances around at the chaotic scene behind him. Still enraged, Van Terry shouts after Madison before being carried through the other courtroom exit by a number of court officers and civilian supporters. He was later released without charge and spoke to a local news outlet to explain his actions, saying that he turned to look at the man who killed his daughter, and when he saw Madison breaking into a grin, he simply lost his mind. But when I turned around and looked at him, and he hit me with that grin, I lost my mind. Michael Madison is currently sitting on death row at Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville, though no execution date has been set for him as of yet.